Welcome to J-Life with Daniel. I'm your host, Rabbi Daniel Levine. Okay, well, before we get into this week's podcast, I wanted to take a moment and invite you all a Chag Pesach Sameach, a happy holiday of Passover. I hope that you and your families have a wonderful and meaningful Passover. For the podcast today, we're talking to Ari Middleman. Ari has just written a book called Paths of the Righteous, and it's a documentation of eight contemporary non-Jews who in some way are standing up for the Jewish community. Now, this is a really interesting book because oftentimes, and as you'll see, we do get into this in the conversation, there's a sentiment in the Jewish community where it's an us versus them, where we know that anti-Semitism, both in the form of anti-Zionism when it comes to Israel or the recent proliferation of anti-Semitism in America, oftentimes it feels like we're left alone with very few allies coming to our defense. In this way, Ari's book is fascinating as it specifically focuses on people outside the Jewish community that are doing really incredible work and advocacy and various other forms of allyship specifically to help the Jewish community. It's one of the things that I think each Jewish community contemporarily needs to discuss where there's this interesting balance. And as you'll see, we do get into this a little bit during the podcast, but there's this interesting balance between viewing everybody else outside the Jewish community. If we have a model of us versus them, there's a danger that oftentimes it could turn into a self-fulfilling prophecy. If we keep on repeating the fact that we're alone and that we have no allies, to what extent are we actually forcing that truth come the future? In this way, I think Ari's book is fascinating because it specifically forces us to take a step back and look at models and individuals who really are doing incredible Jewish allyship. And now I bring you Ari Middleman. Okay, I am here with Ari Middleman, who's just written an incredible new book, Paths of the Righteous. Ari, welcome to J-Life with Daniel. Well, uh, Rabbi, it's a pleasure. Thank you. Yeah, I'm really glad that you connected, and I'm really excited to be talking about all the incredible stories and the wider ethos of this book. Just before we get to the book specifically, what's your background? How did you end up writing this really unique type of book? Uh, Well, thank you again uh, for the opportunity, and thank you for the work that um, uh, you do each and every day uh, in in the trenches, uh, so to speak. Um, Look, I, I... I always answer that question uh, saying I'm from Pennsylvania, um, that'll always be home. Haven't lived there for about two decades. I'm now in the DC suburbs in Maryland, but I imagine that my background is not too different from, um, from yours, even though you're on the West coast, uh, and from uh, a lot of your listeners. Um, I mean that in that, uh, Judaism central to my life, uh, certainly starting up, uh, very young age, growing up in Allentown, Pennsylvania with a name like, uh, Ari, my legal name is actually Arye, uh, Eliezer. Um, in grade school, I was fortunate enough to go to, um, uh, the Jewish day school we had there. Uh, I should say have, uh, it's thriving. And, um, I became a bar mitzvah in Israel. I was a regional board member of, uh, NCSY. Um, you know, and as I referenced in the book, the most poignant memories growing up, uh, really were conversations with my father walking to and from, uh, shul. Um, I guess I would also just say quickly, um, uh, once again, thank you for the incredible work you do uh, with with college students. You know, as we're all watching this this horrible horrible war in Ukraine, it was actually two weeks uh, two, uh, two weeks I spent twenty years ago, right around now around Pesach uh, was my first trip to Ukraine. I was a group of about ten students uh, chosen from Washington area high, uh, Hillel's, um, and we went over and we were with high school students and with. Uh, Hillel students in Ukraine, and I subsequently went back uh, many times. Uh, so uh, long way of saying uh, Judaism has always been a central part of my life. And um, uh, yeah, look forward to seeing where our discussion goes. Yeah, no, I love that. And, you know, it is funny because there's a lot of parallels to my my background. I was also on the NCSY board, and that was sort of my community when I was in high school. I went to a Jewish day school, basically from zero to 18. And my entire social circle, to some extent, wasn't just the Jewish community, it was actually 99% the modern Orthodox community. Um, So in that sense, there's actually something interesting about your book, which is it's a Jewish book written all about non-Jews or Gentiles or however we want to sort of frame that. 
was there sort of a moment in your life where you sort of realized the importance of bringing in people outside the Jewish community into the communal conversation? And the last thing that I'll sort of say is, I remember growing up with sort of the stereotypical Jewish view of, well, everybody who's not Jewish is either lukewarm towards us at best or hates us and wants to kill us. And so you always have to come with that sort of skepticism. And your book really tries to, I think, turn around that picture and says, no, listen, we aren't alone. We have allies. We have people that are trying to support us in whatever we do. Was there sort of an early moment in your life where you realized that? Or was that sort of something that happened later? Well, just to take a step back, you have me uh, beat when I mean, you said zero to 18. Um, I didn't, I, uh, I guess I got started at age four or five. Um, but uh, I, I was born in New York and then uh, went to Pennsylvania from kindergarten onward. Uh, the reason we went to Pennsylvania, and I think this um, hopefully answers your question, Rabbi, uh, is um, my father was uh, recruited to um, start up a Jewish studies program at, at ironically, the oldest Lutheran college in America, um, Muhlenberg College in, in Allentown, Pennsylvania. Um, shortly thereafter, my, uh, my late mother um, uh, built a, a Hillel at Muhlenberg. I think to this day, Muhlenberg College is somewhere around a third to even close to 40% uh, uh, Jewish, which is once wow. again somewhat ironic for a Lutheran school. But I mentioned all that because um, you know, I developed a, a, a passion for everything we're, we're talking about um, and, you know, specifically giving back to the broader Jewish community and then, you know, our, our role um, in this day and age um, with, you know, really just diverse, like, conversations around Shabbos dinner tables on, on Friday night, um, you know, hearing Jewish and non-Jewish uh, guests uh, from all over the country and even abroad um, you know, coming through campus. Uh, so I, I, I think that maybe is how I would, uh, how I would answer your question. Yeah, no, that, that totally makes sense. And I'm just sort of reflecting on, on my upbringing. You know, I grew up in an area in San Diego where I think until the early to mid 1960s, it was illegal for Jews to buy property on the street that I ultimately grew up. And I remember when the shoal, we tried to set up an Eruv, it was just a whole mess with sort of, you know, everywhere ranging from, implicit anti-Semitism to explicit. So I think it's actually really important to sort of highlight the other side of the picture. Um, I, I know you've been quoted as saying that, well, listen, if we have this sort of outlook where everybody that's not Jewish is sort of out to get us, it can actually lead into some sort of self-fulfilling prophecy. Um, I'm wondering if you could talk about that a little more. Was this book sort of written in response to a sentiment where all you heard in terms of people discussion and the books that were written and articles were about Basically, the Jewish community needs to protect itself against sort of outsiders who want to come, you know, attack or say idly by Walfing's attack. I'm just, you know, wanted to dig a little bit deeper there. Well, sure thing. I look. Let's 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 take a step back. Um, you know, going to and from shul, walking about a mile, uh, growing up in, in Allentown, Pennsylvania. Uh, I. I Maybe I'm blissfully ignorant. Maybe I blocked out things from you know, 30 plus years ago, but I don't remember a singular instance of, of anti-Semitism. Um, you know, even my time at the George Washington University, uh, graduated in 2004. Uh, I don't remember any uh, uh, sorts of instances. Uh, and once again, you know, my legal name is Arya Eliezer. Um, uh, I. Uh, yeah, that being said, I distinctly remember when that horrible tragedy happened in uh, Buenos Aires um, with the terrorist bombing there, uh, you know, really kind of the first instance uh, as a community, as day school students at, at our shul, at our congregation, uh, gathering and you know, really kind of reflecting. This is also, you'll recall, the same time that uh, there was just horrible bus bombings uh, across Israel. Uh, this was in the mid-90s. So, um, it really kind of opened up my eyes. Um, so two different distinct uh, themes there. To answer your question, I mean, this book began um, yeah, during a pretty difficult, tough time. Uh, you know, the truth is I didn't set out to, to write a book. Uh, I know the Pittsburgh community incredibly well. Um, I would have never imagined in my wildest dreams, or I should say my, my darkest nightmares growing up in Pennsylvania, that, that 
what happened on that last Shabbos in October 2018 could could happen anywhere, um, let alone in a community I know so well, and, and certainly you being from San Diego, um, you know, uh, I think all your listeners recall what happened the last day of, of Pesach in April 2019. So it was kind of that one-two punch, um, and then we sh- certainly shouldn't forget what happened around Hanukkah in New York and New Jersey, um, in Muncie and Jersey City, the most diverse part of the world, uh, literally, uh, two other violent, deadly anti-Semitic attacks. So, um, you know, I was looking for a reason to be hopeful uh, rather than just kind of wallow in my sadness and these depressing headlines and turn inward as a community as we we often do. And we have meaningful conversations with, uh, you know, with within the community, but, um, you know, that only gets us uh, so far. Yeah, and this is, I think, the best type of writing, you know, just as somebody who's written never a book, but just a series of articles, it's always much more difficult when I pre-plan or set out to write something and almost never turns out as good as when I'm acting in response to something that I see or some sort of momentary inspiration. So I think that's a really interesting sort of focal point that you never actually meant to write this book. It's not like 10 years ago, you had this sort of vision. It really was what you were seeing on the ground day to day and both in terms of your professional life and also personal life in terms of your connections to different communities. In terms of that theme of sort of being hopeful, what are sort of one or two examples? I know that you sort of outline and delineate eight specific people. I know it's probably really hard for you to choose which ones to focus on, but what are sort of one or two examples that could sort of whet listeners' appetite? And, you know, hopefully they'll go and read the book and check out all eight of them. Well, um, uh, yeah, I would certainly appreciate that. Thank you, uh, uh, Rabbi. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, thank uh, goodness um, the momentum of uh, the book came out on February 2nd in the United States it launched in Israel beforehand. Uh, we're already uh, uh, coming up on a third printing. And, you know, just you know, thank God there's been tremendous momentum. Um, the, uh, I, would, I would take a step back. Uh, this really began in earnest, um, like so many good things in my life by, by happenstance. Uh, it was two weeks after uh, that awful attack at the Chabad in Poway, um, and uh, my wife uh, had organized a program um, in our community in Maryland, uh, and uh, I had zero, literally zero interest in going. It was, I think, a, you know, a 7.30 or 8 o'clock start time. I had been in a suit and tie running around Washington for however many hours, 12 plus hours, and... Um, the you know she said because she's just convincing and I, I always listen to what she said I, she said minimally come for the sushi like any good Jewish program uh, you know there was a there was a spread before the speaking program uh, began and the speaker started speaking and you know I, I literally thought I was going to be there for five minutes and then I stayed for the entire program two hours later uh, the speaker is the first individual I profile in my book um, his name's Aston Bright he's uh, right out of Central Casting. Um, the large uh, black firefighter from uh, Broward County, uh, South Florida. And uh, without giving away uh, his profile in the book, he, he literally has spent his vacation time uh, fighting wildfires um, uh, over in, uh, in Israel, wow. uh, completely as a volunteer. And he's telling this story uh, when, you know, two weeks after the, the horrible tragedy there uh, in your, your home uh, county, and I just said, wow, that was incredibly inspiring. Uh, so we, uh, we met up the next morning and I realized listening to him, you know, there's a lot of folks that are not household names. They're not in the headlines, but they're just doing just incredibly inspiring work. Um, and uh, one thing led to the other. And, you know, through roughly 4,000, 5,000 word fast paced short stories, you know, I don't think I've captured Aston's entire incredible resume, but you know, hopefully readers get a sense of just, you know, what makes these incredible uh, non-Jews uh, tick. Yeah. And, and why do you think, I mean, obviously sort of taking a step back and contextualizing, right, this, this idea of the Jewish community's relationship with individuals that are sort of outside, you know, we have this concept throughout Tanakh and rabbinic literature of the Ger Toshav, you know, somebody from outside the community that's affiliated and associated in a way that almost blurs that boundary between Jewish community and not Jewish community, then of course, you know, with Yad Vashem and and the state of Israel setting up specific commemorations for the righteous among the Gentiles, for of course, people that aren't Jewish that did heroic work really at risk to their own personal lives and the lives of their family and community during the Holocaust, really at no self 
gain or benefit to actually go and protect Jews. But it's still not a topic that you often see. You know, it, it is it is really, I think, important to highlight just the unique aspect of of a book like this or of specific focuses that want to highlight things that are outside the Jewish community, but in a way that's positive and people being allies, because again, it's a much easier, both in terms, right, we're, we're constantly in this competition for attention, for fundraising, you know, we can talk about social media and the algorithms that sort of control our lives. And so that basically inspires this type of wanting to, I'm trying to think of the right word here, you try to have, you know, very flashy article titles that inspire divisiveness of saying, well, everybody outside the Jewish community hates us, or this BDS resolution passed, or anti-Semitic attack happening here. And both in terms of what's going to catch people's eyes, and also in terms of just our own community and what's going to excite people and bring people out is a story of us versus them oftentimes, which of course is not really the reality, but it seems that it creates this sociological trend where people are more hesitant to actually go out and highlight stories like this. Um, I'm, I'm actually curious to sort of flip the script for a second. What's been the reaction, you know, to the extent that, you know, you're respecting people's privacy, the eight individuals that, that you wrote about, what has been their reaction to you saying, hey, listen, I want to write an entire book basically with your story because it's really unique. And I think it's really important for the Jewish community to, to hear. Well, I, I should say that each of these eight individuals, um, super grateful that they gave me their most valuable resource. They gave me their time, um, you know, such as I suppose if there's any silver lining of, of the pandemic as we all got familiar with Zoom. Uh, so by and large, our discussions uh, were conducted over Zoom um, in uh, the first part of 2020. The uh, conversations were everything from the, the personal to the philosophical and everything in between. Uh, thank God with this, uh, with the launch, uh, with this book launch, uh, since um, uh, it came to the United States in February, uh, we've had a great reception, either on Zoom or in person. Uh, we're doing events, uh, always with one, if not two, of the individuals I profile in the book, um, with uh, with with congregations, with with JCRCs, with federations, with JCCs, with day schools. Uh, so, uh, and it's really, I mean, it's, it's, it's exciting. I mean, by and large, these audiences thus far uh, are Jewish and the organizers are, are, uh, are, are certainly, uh, you know, they're, they're Jewish organizations, but we're already getting inquiries uh, from various uh, pro-Israel um, Christian community uh, leaders. That's a world I'm, I'm frankly not too familiar about. Uh, just a few days ago in, in Washington, DC, we had an event uh, hosted by the uh, 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 Croatian ambassador. Uh, Croatia is obviously a deeply Catholic country, uh, but I profile a, a Croatian in the book. And we had folks from the diplomatic community uh, that frankly say over 80% of the room wasn't Jewish, uh, you know, including a pastor from one of the largest churches in, in, in Virginia drove up. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see where, um, where, where it goes, but you know, thank God the last two months have had a lot of momentum. That's really incredible. And so, first of all, Mazal Tov on that. That's really great to hear. In terms of, you you brought up Israel. So without getting into any explicit political stances or anything, where do you think Israel fits into this sort of story of the Jewish community and the need for allies outside the Jewish community? Just in terms of how you want to frame, you know, there's been obviously a lot of discourse about the overlapping or lack of overlapping, depending on which side of the political spectrum one falls out in the American Jewish community of anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism. We've certainly addressed that on the podcast before, but just sort of in your mind, is it, is it synonymous? You know, is standing up for Israel the same thing as standing up for the Jewish community? Just how do you view those uh, topics? One, one, 100%. I, I don't understand that distinction. That's probably a, a discussion in its own right or a podcast with new guests uh, uh, explaining that, that, but I, I don't understand that, that distinction, period. Um, look, of the eight individuals I profile, uh, two or more uh, doing incredible work uh, and have done in recent years, just really impactful work related to uh, the Holocaust. Um, whereas the other six, uh, certainly they've stood up and gone above and beyond for our community, but, uh, by and large, the 
snapshot. Once again, these are 4,000 to 5,000 word fast paced short stories. The, the hmm. snapshot of their incredible work is, is, is something related to, uh, to the state of Israel. Yeah. So, so in my work, I do a lot of Israel education and a lot of talking to people both within the Jewish community and outside about Israel and Zionism and sort of not, again, not in any sort of partisan political way, but just in sort of a general sense of the centrality and importance and ubiquity of Israel within Jewish tradition to the extent where I think I'm in 90 percent agree with you in terms of the fact that it's very, very tough to make a distinction between anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism, although in some theoretical lab, you know, may maybe it's possible in terms of, you know, practicality, pragmatic, you know, day-to-day -day social relations. I think that's a lot harder said than done. I I've noticed a trend. I'm just sort of curious to bounce some ideas off of you of whenever I talk to people outside of the Jewish community about Israel, about anti-Semitism, about Zionism, there's sort of oftentimes this light bulb moment where for them, just everything sort of clicks and they're like, oh, wow, I now understand just the, not just the horrors of anti-Semitism, but just the ubiquity of it within the way that a lot of people like to discuss Israel, even down to the outright obsession with it. I mean, the fact that the UN can talk about Israel a hundred times more than virtually any other country, there's oftentimes this moment where they're like, oh, okay, well, why, why is this the case? And then you can start engaging them in a wider question of, well, listen, you know, here's the history of anti-Semitism. Anti-Semitism in some way can be said to be baked into certain systems that the Western world has. And so why would we think that would just all of a sudden disappear, you know, two, three generations after the Holocaust? Were the people that, that you highlight, were there sort of like one inspirational moment that came to them where they realized that they wanted to be sort of allied with Israel with the Jewish community? Was it sort of a slow realization? I'm sure there's also probably some, some difference of sort of inspirational moments there, but did you, did you get to sort of unpack their sort of origin story of uh, Jewish allyship? Uh, yes. Uh, and my publisher encourages me that uh, folks will get a real sense of it if they, if they buy the book and read the book. Um, but uh, to give a, to give a quick snapshot, uh, my, Late mother always said that the six most powerful words in the English language are let me tell you a story. So I alluded to uh, the ambassador um, from Croatia uh, in Washington, DC. Uh, previously, he was posted in, uh, in uh, their embassy in Israel. Uh, I'm super grateful that he uh, opened up the Washington embassy. He invited uh, other diplomats. And we had a really meaningful, thoughtful conversation. It was probably the first time, maybe the last time, that the Embassy of Croatia contracts with the VOD of Washington and had kosher catering. Uh, but it was really special for a lot of reasons uh, the other night. Um, we honored, and uh, the panel discussion was with um, uh, someone who many of your listeners probably have never heard of, but uh, his name's Professor uh, Dragan Primorats. So Dr. Primorat's got his MD, PhD uh, in Connecticut. Uh, if folks remember, Croatia was part of Yugoslavia. There were horrible wars in the first uh, uh, part of the 90s. Uh, he was getting his PhD uh, and MD um, uh, while that was happening. His professors, his mentors were all Jewish. Mm -hmm. Growing up in Tito's Yugoslavia, he knew nothing about the Holocaust. Uh, frankly, what happened in the territory that's currently Croatia during World War II was awful. I mean, probably the most heinous and vile uh, uh, death camps and uh, uh, if we can call them pogroms. In, without giving away uh, his profile in the book, um, he literally modeled, he became, uh, before the age of 40, he was asked to become the education minister and the science minister. Uh, and he, uh, he, he modeled the entire Croatian post-socialist education system off of the Israeli system because it was uh, Israeli PhDs and Jewish American PhDs who were his professors. Uh, he didn't have to do this. It just seemed logical to him. And I mention all this because I think now if you were to stop anyone uh, of importance uh, who knows what they're talking about on the streets of Jerusalem, they'd probably say that their best friend in the European Union uh, is Croatia. You know, little four and a half million person country with an incredibly dark, difficult past during World War II uh, is probably now one of the most philo-Semitic um, 
pro-Israel countries uh, in the European Union. Um, so to a person, each of the eight individuals I profile, um, four men, four women, some Americans, some uh, from abroad, uh, it, was, it was some sort of personal connection, a, a friend, a mentor in their life uh, that opened up their eyes. And in the process, they, they just did the right thing. It was never the lucrative thing. It was never the easiest path to take. They just never thought twice about it. It just seemed like the right thing to do um, because their friends were just happened to be uh, happened to be Jewish and did uh, did good by them. Yeah, it's amazing. And I wanted to sort of pick up on, on two things that you said, because I think it's a really important thing to highlight, especially just in terms of the, the platform and the listeners of, of this podcast. In, in some way, this book is a story about individuals and the power of both relationships and the power that basically every individual has an opportunity to do incredible things. And, you know, a lot of this work, you know, just from, you know, the stories that I got to read in, in terms of the book seem very bottom up in a sense. Somebody, you know, had this inspirational or relationship with the Jewish community, and then they decided on their own fruition to basically come up with an idea or a platform or institution or sort of way to engage which I think speaks to the work that I, I know a lot of the listeners of this podcast are, you know, obviously engaged in the Jewish community, but some of them either work or philanthropically give to various Jewish institutions. And really it all at the end of the day comes down to those relationships that we create. And we can talk about wider trends and we can talk about data. Or we can talk about, you know, overarching philosophic or political ideas, which are crucial. And, you know, I sort of am a nerd and love talking about those things. But at the end of the day, it's about cultivating those relationships between people and really seeing the humanity of, of others. And it seems like when that happens, something clicks really on, on both sides of the equation, which is, hey, listen, this is a story about people and we don't like it when people are under attack. If those people happen to be Jews, great, I'm going to stand up and do something. Um, I wanted to, you know, I know our, our time's getting a little short here, but you had mentioned Ukraine at the beginning of the podcast, I think, you know, it would be foolish not to ask a little bit about, you know, what's happening, not so much in a political sense, but I'm curious in terms of the Jewish community's relationship and a lot of the initiatives that I know the Jewish community has in the works and has been doing and will hopefully continue to be doing in terms of Ukraine, just sort of two ideas that I want to throw out there and then, you know, happy for you to take it in whatever direction. So I know there's been a series of, you know, North American Jewish leaders that have gone to Poland or gone to other places in the region to sort of be on the ground and sort of help deal with the, the refugee crisis and things like that and basically be of support. There's obviously been a lot of talk about Israel certainly opening up to Jewish Ukrainian refugees, also allowing in a certain number of non-Jewish Ukrainian refugees. Of course, people can endlessly debate if it's too much, too little. You know, I don't want to get into the weeds there, uh, but I'm curious in terms of big picture, given that the story of Ukraine right now sort of is going to be you know, the story of 2022, where do you think the, the Jewish community fits in there? Okay, a lot to uh, unpackage there. So let's let's take a, a step back. Um, it was, uh, frankly, incredibly surprising that the Yeshiva University uh, Sfarim sale um, purchased uh, a lot of my books, and um, they invited um, uh, uh, myself, and uh, I invited one of the, uh, actually two of the incredibly inspiring folks um, that I profile in the book to join. So we had a discussion with um, Yeshiva University. And if your listeners are familiar uh, or not, it's, it's uh, you know, in the northern tip of Manhattan, uh, you know, in New York City, in a, a neighborhood called Washington Heights, uh, which is overwhelmingly um, uh, Spanish speaking, uh, the primarily, I believe, Dominican. Um, and uh, one of the um, incredible non-Jews who I profile on in the book uh, her name's Gloria Garces. Uh, she splits her time between South Florida and her native Guatemala. And uh, she said something really impactful. You know, she said that when you're going uh, to the corner store, or you're waiting for the bus in New York City, and you're you're you know you're wearing a kippa, or you know you're 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 you you are in whether you know it or not, you are an ambassador. Um, and you know, whether you know how to speak Spanish, whether you have any interest in ever going to the Dominican Republic, whether the Dominicans have any interest in ever going to Israel, um, that silent conversation, uh, if I could use that term, is is happening. And I think that's something that that listeners um, in a place as diverse as Southern California should um, 
should always uh, uh, keep in mind. It was, it was, she certainly said it much better, but it was very eye-opening to me. I was also reminded, Rabbi, when you were saying um, uh, uh, those excellent points, what Dr. King um, would often say, uh, Martin Luther King, he would say, injustice anywhere is a threat to uh, justice everywhere. Mm. Um, and that, that came up uh, literally the first event we did here in the United States with the launch of the book was with the Jewish Federation of uh, Delaware. And they, they timed it with Dr. King's birthday. And we had uh, black leaders and Jewish leaders from um, the state of Delaware. Um, and uh, there was a lot of that theme that I had, had not thought about, you know, with, with this really unprecedented, awful rise in anti-Semitism that we're facing here, um, but that certainly Jews in Europe have, have seen um, uh, over the last decade, you know, we shouldn't forget uh, that when we look at the FBI statistics each year, there's unprecedented hate against our fellow Americans who are Asian, uh, Black Americans. Uh, so it, this is, unfortunately, it's, a, it's to use the term a virus, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, the hate, hate is hate. Uh, what happened in Pittsburgh impacted me, I think impacted everyone uh, of your listeners, but uh, it impacted the community of Pittsburgh, Jewish and non-Jewish um, uh, as a whole. Uh, regarding Ukraine, uh, we, we could have an entirely uh, different podcast. As I said at the outset, it was 20 years ago this month uh, that I made my first trip there. Uh, it was uh, to the community that unfortunately is known around the world now, Kharkiv, mm. which is up in the northeast corner, second largest uh, city um unfortunately that city is completely unrecognizable um folks might remember that the first day of the war a uh, really powerful image of rabbi moskowitz the rabbi there um with uh just a thriving thriving congregation about forty thousand jews in, in kharkiv at the time uh this image of him leaning to fill in um it, even you could hear on a, on instagram in the background uh you know these loud thuds uh, unfortunately, within the week, um, about a week into the war, uh, the Hillel building, one which I have countless memories from over the years, um, was reduced to rubble. Uh, and you know, I think what makes this most emotional and difficult for me, I'll end on this, is that when I was preparing to go there with a group of 10 Hillel students in um, 2001, 2002, uh, you know, I would often hear people say, what, there's still Jews there, especially young Jews. What, 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 you know, what, what, what are they doing? Really? You're going to spend Passover with, with who, why, why are you going there? You know, and I think we've often thought that over this last, um, uh, 40 some awful days of this war. Um, and I would push back. I mean, my last trip to Ukraine, uh, I, I had never done this, but I flew from the Kiev Boris Bull airport to, uh, uh, to Tel Aviv's Ben-Gurion Airport. It's about a three hour flight. Uh, there's multiple flights a day uh, before this war. You know, and on that first trip in 2002, meeting students, Hillel students who had previously just gone on a birthright trip, like so many American Hillel students at the time as birthright was beginning in 2002, meeting young professionals who had the chance to make Aliyah, they chose not to for whatever reason, just like every American has the chance and, chooses not to, yet a cousin or an uncle might have made Aliyah, and they, in the age of the internet just beginning in 2002, they were doing the back-end coding and all of this and building a business in Ukraine, and so many stories like that. Uh, so I would just say one final point. I was really honored uh, to be flown down and have a great discussion with leaders in the Arizona Jewish community uh, around the book uh, last month, and um, you know, something uh, one of the leaders in the community brought up, I had not thought about this, is the unity. Uh, I think that North American Jews and Jews worldwide are now feeling mm. uh, when there's been so much that's been written about divisions of diaspora Jews, reform versus from Jews, uh, people's thoughts on Israel, etc. Uh, I think all of that is kind of on the side of the road. And there's just a common sense of, a, uh, of purpose at this point. Yeah, I know that's a really, that's a really great message. And I know, you know, just in terms of the timing of this episode, we'll drop 
sometime in the middle of uh, Pesach. And so I'm just, you know, thinking of sort of the first national moment of the Jewish people, of course, leaving, leaving Egypt and then sort of the 40 years wandering in the desert. But there's a specific verse that I think has, you know, when you were talking about sort of the unity, it just immediately made me jump to this, where when the Jewish people are camped out right under Har Sinai, the Torah basically uses a singular verb. It says, Vayichin neged hahar, right? And he camped. And so, of course, the rabbis, you know, get out their, you know, thinking caps and the rabbis say, well, it, it uses a word for a singular person camping because it was as if the Jewish people was sort of one collective being as opposed to sort of being fractured in different ideological camps or national camps or, you know, scattered throughout the world. And I think it's such a really incredible message to, you know, end on in terms of just one or two final questions. And really, thank you so much for, for your time here. This is really so incredible. But yeah, just, just, just really quick. Uh, yeah. You, you got in a beautiful word of Torah there. Um, you know, if folks remember what also coincided with the 2002 Pesach, um, uh, and I was on the, you know, it was, it was our, our, our third day on the ground in Ukraine, our first day in Kharkiv, uh, once again, as a group of 10 American undergraduates, um, uh, was that awful, awful terrorist attack in Netanya. Yeah. where an entire hotel was leveled and it was the deadliest terror attack of the second intifada uh, where 30 uh, uh, Jews who went to a Pesach Seder at a hotel uh, uh, died and upward of 140 were, 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 were permanently uh, uh, injured. But uh, the next 10 days that we spent, despite the language barrier, despite growing up in completely different childhoods, uh, USSR versus the United States, I was reminded again and again of uh, the, the famous metaphor and the Pasuk from the, the, the Exodus, uh, with one heart, like one person. And that, that's really how I think we felt. And that really kind of solidified for me that as diverse uh, as our community is, you know, two Jews, five opinions, we, we uh, you know, sometimes it's two Jews, 10 opinions, but you know, we, we're, we're all in this together. I, I love that. Yeah, you can, you know, two Jews, 10 opinions, one heart, you know, is sort of the the ideal moving forward. So last two questions, really, thank you so much for your time. This is, you know, such an incredible conversation. I do highly recommend that that everybody that listens to this go check out the book. The first question, just in terms of big picture, take this however you want. Do you sort of have a, a what's next project? Is this sort of a one off or do you really want to sort of either write a follow-up to this book or sort of continue doing work around this sort of wider topic of, you know, non-Jews or people outside the Jewish community that are helping. And then the second will hopefully be an easier question. Um, how can people reach you if they want, you know, in terms of any speaking engagement or finding the book or things like that? Well, thanks very much. Um, uh, we'll take, we'll take that, the last one first. Um, the, uh, the, the website that was built for the book is uh, fairly straightforward. It's just my name.com. So that's uh, Ari, A-R-I, Middleman, M-I-T-T-L-E-M-A-N.com. Uh, Perfect. And we'll um, put that in the uh, show notes so people Thank you so much. And then the that. previous question, I look, I think there's probably uh, of the eight incredible non-Jewish individuals I profile, uh, there's there's probably thousands. Um of stories out there uh, like this. Um, and we just need to look for the positive in these uncertain times. You know, I think that's an antidote uh, for what we've seen with the Jewish community in recent years. Uh, and it's just always easier to kind of wallow in our sadness or turn inward, but, um, you know, looking for the positive and, and, and optimism. Um, I don't, uh, uh, you know, it comes up at every discussion I have you know, uh, I was just in Philadelphia at a book event in Pennsylvania, and a woman got quite emotional, uh, non-Jewish uh, woman. Her, uh, her her dad was born in Greece, and, and she was sharing stories about uh, what he did um, during the Holocaust with uh, his classmates. Um, and, you know, I look, there's probably another book to be had, but one step at a time, we're only two months into, uh, into this book, st- uh, book tour. I love it. Well, Ari, thank you so much for coming on J Life with Daniel. Thank you. Thank you again for the work you do.